Welcome back, y'all. Hopefully, none of you had any breakdown of your unfortunate sacrums. And if you do, if you do, I'm prescribing some more education on DSI science. Because come on, y'all, let's face it. You are not going to be able to stay in your chairs for the rest of this education. So exciting. I, I can feel how exciting y'all are. Now, if it's been too long for you to remember, in that first part of the video, we went over the evidence that says peri-intubation hypoxia is common and it's harmful and it's predictable and what we should do about it. Now let's dive into the evidence that supports each of the components of the DSI protocol. We're also going to discuss how this has worked out so far in real EMS life. That's right, y'all are not the guinea pigs. We're going to hear a bit more about DSI's track record at the end of this video. Enjoy, y'all. We know that placing the patient in a heads-up position improves the percent of glottic opening. That's called POGO, percent of glottic opening. Now, Dr. Rich Levitan did this study and showed as the head elevation increases, so, do, so does intubating, does do, intubation conditions get better. Let's go with that. Head elevation also, it turns out, prolongs safe apnea period, delaying the time until SpO2 begins to drop. That's good. Now, in this study of healthy OR patients that have been adequately pre-oxygenated and paralyzed for their normal surgery, patients with the head elevated by 20 degrees took longer to desaturate down to 93%. In fact, they had over a minute and a half of extra safe apneic time just because their head was elevated. Well, how should we best achieve pre-oxygenation? Well, by using a BVM or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. These provide better pre-ox than a non-rebreather mask. In this paper by Groombridge, healthy volunteers were randomized into different groups that represent common pre-hospital methods of pre-oxygenation. The primary outcome was FeO2, and that's the fraction of expired oxygen. It's similar to intidal oxygen that we talked about earlier. Now, as you can see, both BVM and non-invasive ventilation performed much, much better than non-rebreather mask. That's why I want us to use the BVM. Using a nasal cannula under BiPAP or CPAP, turns out it does not increase air leak in a significant way, and it eases the transition from preox to apneic oxygenation. So using BiPAP, CPAP, or BVM with flush rate oxygen and PEEP improved preoxygenation and there was less peri-intubation hypoxia compared with non-rebreather mask alone. That's good. Now, in this study of critically ill hypoxic patients in need of intubation in a French ICU, patients were randomized to pre-ox with either a non-rebreather mask or non-invasive ventilation using a ventilator. The group with non-invasive ventilation had higher pulse ox values at the time of intubation. They had higher pre-intubation and peri-intubation low sats, and the higher sats persisted up to five minutes following intubation. Good pre-oxygenation really works. Implementing a bundle of care aimed at good pre-oxygenation, that was associated with decreased rates of DSATs in this helicopter EMS study, down from 58% to 14%, and it improved intubation success from 89% to 98%, most likely because it de-stressed the situation. Maintaining a pre-ox sat of greater than 93% for more than three minutes, just like we've advocated, was associated with a 380% higher odds of first-pass success without hypoxia. Very, very good. Well, speaking of apneic oxygenation, let's take a look. Turns out it works. It was associated with decreased DSATs in healthy OR patients. Let's talk about this slide because I love this slide. This was a study that Dr. Scott Weingart first made popular when he was talking about DSI, and I think it is incredibly informative. This study took healthy patients who were undergoing surgery for something. They paralyzed them just like they normally would. They intubated them, and then rather than in, uh, ventilating, they just grabbed oxygen delivery tubing, put it in the ET tube, and cranked up the oxygen no ventilation at all. And the goal was to see how long it would take them to desaturate. 
Now, looking at this table, you're going to notice some of those times are up to 55 minutes without any ventilation. Now, you may notice that these patients did not desaturate. The SATs, they never got low. Take a look at those pH values. Man, they are all under 7, and that is bad. Look at those CO2 values. Those things are really high, and that's what's driving the pH down. Bad, bad, bad. But it's not a reflection of poor oxygenation. Remember, apneic oxygenation works. They didn't desaturate. It's a reflection that we really do need to blow the CO2 off at some point, just not within a couple of minutes. The oxygen sat drops way before elevated CO2 becomes a problem. So for the love of all that's holy, please don't try this experiment at home. But the reason I show it to you is that it demonstrates that if you're just looking at maintaining pulse ox, apneic oxygenation can do that. And for the time it takes us to intubate, that's exactly what we're looking for. We want to prolong that safe apnea time to allow us to make a safer intubation. So how does it do that if you're not forcing air in and they're not sucking air down? Diffusion. It turns out Brownian motion gas lot works. The oxygen will diffuse from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now, one other thing about this, notice this study. This study was published in 1959. This is not exactly earth-shaking, breaking news science. But I do kind of doubt we're ever going to see something like this again. There is no IRB in the world that's going to approve this study today. Honestly, that's probably a good thing. I don't think it was ethical to do this study. But I'm glad we have the results. So apneic oxygenation is also associated with 120% higher odds, a bit over twofold, of first-pass success without hypoxia. It also decreased the rate of peri-intubation hypoxia from 29% to 7%. We like that. We're trying to avoid peri-intubation hypoxia. Apneic oxygenation, it works. So in this systematic review and meta-analysis, apneic oxygenation was associated with 34% lower odds of peri-intubation. That is a good thing, my friends. All right, let's get to delayed sequence intubation, or DSI. DSI is the process of giving ketamine, followed by a delay in giving the paralytic to allow for better pre-oxygenation. DSI improved the SpO2 from 89% after maximal efforts at pre-oxygenation up to 89% in this 2015 study of ICU patients by Drs. Weingart and Truger. This is the paper that put DSI on the emergency medicine and EMS roadmap. So DSI has been successfully used, obviously, in the ICU, in the ER, and in EMS. We adopted this protocol, the same protocol we're adopting here when I was in Williamson County. We experienced a sentinel event with a critical patient that involved peri-intubation hypoxia, bradycardia, and cardiac arrest. That sentinel event may, may, just may, theoretically, hypothetically, may have been very similar to a case you might have heard at the beginning of this talk. At Williamson County, we then underwent a quality improvement project aimed at changing the environment, changing the culture, changing the processes around intubating non-arrest patients. The aim of this project was to prevent peri-intubation hypoxia. First, we went back and looked at our data to make sure this critical event wasn't a one-off event. And it turns out it wasn't. It was not isolated. In fact, 44% of our RSIs had a peri-intubation hypoxic event. We found two additional cases, as a matter of fact, of peri-intubation cardiac arrest, and that put us right in line with the existing literature on how often this happens. The literature, once again, says that between 2 to 3% of all intubations end up in cardiac arrest, and almost all of those are driven by peri-intubation hypoxia. So we implemented a bundle of care that consisted of a mandatory checklist-driven protocol that included proper positioning, goal-directed pre-oxygenation, apneic oxygenation, and DSI for all non-arrest intubations. Positioning required that the head of the bed be elevated at least 30 degrees and that the patient be placed in an ear to sternal notch, or as I like to say, a pint-sipping position. 
Goal-directed pre-oxygenation, that means we used a BVM with PEEP valve and a reservoir with flush rate oxygen, of course, held with two-person two person thumbs-down seal, lifting the mandible, not pushing, and achieving an SpO2 of 94% or higher for at least three continuous minutes. We use nasal cannulas to increase to flush rate after sedation with ketamine. So give them the ketamine, turn the oxygen all the way on. That's really what we mean by DSI. Now, DSI was performed with ketamine and neurocuronium in all of our patients. And if we couldn't achieve goal-directed or goal saturations, intubation was not allowed under any condition. If the patient needed airway protection rapidly or if we couldn't hit our pre-ox goals, then they aborted the attempt and moved on to a rescue superglottic, using rocuronium if needed, but they went to a superglottic. Now, the reason, and I get this question a lot, the reason for placing a blind insertion device like an iGel or an AirQ or a King LT is that they're faster than intubating. And there's good literature on that. And they're also more successful. And the patient is less likely, therefore, to have a rapid, rapid desat. So we published the results of this QI effort at Williamson County in Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2018. I'd like to tell you a little bit about it because this is the experience I expect us to have here. And I might add, in our trial, it is exactly the experience that we had in Williamson County. So we looked at 104 intubations that were done before we implemented the bundle, and we compared them to 87 intubations done after. The patient characteristics of these two groups was very, very similar. The primary outcome of the study was the proportion of patients who experienced peri-intubation hypoxia, and that rate, the bottom line, that rate, dropped from 44% to 3.5%. After we implemented the bundle, the 25th percentile peri-intubation low, that increased from 74% up to 96%. That's really good. The rate of bradycardia, it decreased from 18% down to 2%. We graphically represent this change in pulse ox at the beginning of the attempt and the low SAT during the attempt. This, this representation is what we call a waterfall plot, and I'm really proud of the code that we wrote to make this, so I'm going to share it with you. Each intubation is shown on this graph by two points connected by a line. The top dot is the SpO2 at the time the intubation began, and the bottom dot is the lowest the pulse ox got during the attempt. Basically, the longer that vertical line, the more desaturation there was. And you're going to notice that there are far more desaturations, far longer lines occurring in the blue before group than in the red after group. So our experience there clearly demonstrated that paying attention to the details of intubation, particularly achieving adequate pre-oxygenation, proper patient positioning, apneic oxygenation, goal-directed oxygen saturations, and DSI, can definitely statistically and clinically significantly decrease peri-intubation hypoxia. Now, that's not the only way to achieve this goal, but it worked really well for us. It's worked well for others, and as I said before, it's working well here too. We've now completed 14 intubations using this protocol during our trial here in Fort Worth. We've seen above 95% first-pass success without hypoxia. Now, I just heard this morning that we had two additional DSIs last night. Both of those were first-pass successes without hypoxia also. So when I say that we're going to intubate right or we're not going to do it, this is what I mean, y'all. And it's why I'm confident that we can do this here too, provided I give you the right tools. I don't think we were doing it before because we weren't giving you the right tools. I'm convinced these protocols are the right tools. I think you're really going to like this approach. The trial data is good. People involved in the trial really like it. And with it, I know that we can collectively assure there are no more cases like Mrs. Smith. Please, please join this crusade to make intubation safer by avoiding peri-intubation hypoxia. Thank you all very much. Thank you for everything you do every day to better serve the citizens of our community. Thanks again, and take care, y'all.